Hi, Bookmatic, lifelong learner. It's, it's great to see you today. We've got a great episode with Arman Chowdhury, the uh, founder of Armani Talks. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate you for having me, Matt. I'm a big fan of your Instagram page, and it was, it's been a pleasure getting to know you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just recently finished your book uh, that I would like to introduce to the audience. It's Speak Easy, How to Be Articulate, Assertive, and Audacious Around People. I just love that subtitle, man. It's a really descriptive subtitle, and it really defines your book very well. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for sending that over to me, let, allowing me to read it and share it with my audience. And uh, yeah, can you talk a little bit about your book and introduce yourself a little bit, introduce about Armani Talks? Um, so yeah, go ahead. The time is yours for your introduction. For sure. So <laughs> with the Armani Talks brand, I started it in June 2018, initially started as a hobby. I was restarting the Toastmasters program. Do you know what that is? Toastmasters? Yeah, actually, I, I'm uh, also part of uh, Toastmasters, or I have attended some meetings in the past. Okay, so yeah, I started it initially in 2016, restarted it in 2018. And as I was restarting it, Matt, I was thinking, you know, how about I tweet a lot of my insights regarding public speaking and just create a, uh, create a thing called Armani Talks Twitter page. So initially started off as that. I was posting a lot of tweets. And over time, I started to get some DMs from different people from around the world who are like, hey, um, I got a best man speech coming up. Uh, can you, uh, can you um, teach me how to create a speech? I'll pay you. And when they said that, I was like, you're not going to pay me. And then they got my PayPal information and sent me the payment for helping them build a speech. And that's initially when I learned that Armani Talks could be a business. And this was something that was insightful for me because I come from the engineering field, a very hard skills field, and I was dealing with public speaking, a very soft skills field. And my goal with Armani Talks was to merge the two worlds together to give practical communication skills insights for hard skills dominant fields, such as engineers and creative people like entrepreneurs. And that's the basic premise of how the Armani Talks brand started. And since then, I've created a lot of YouTube videos uh, books, blogs, and one of them being Speakeasy. Uh, the premise of Speakeasy is to teach people that uh, speaking skills is not something that you're just born with. Where some people are like, oh, I'm shy. I can't do anything about it. While with Speakeasy, it's meant to empower the reader to understand that if you have that desire to become more articulate, uh, to clarify your ideas from your mind to the outside world, you can do it. And the book introduces a lot of innovative concepts, such as the personality-based polymath, uh, such as creating an articulation chamber, a primal brand building in order to connect with other people, and much more other topics that you're not going to find on Google. You're going to have to put in the work, experiment, and over time, speaking skills is going to become an emergent property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the things that I really liked about your book is like, Actually, you have a really unique writing style and like everyone listening and watching this, uh, this episode here, like his book is extremely easy to read, very clear. Actually, I think that's one of the, the biggest tips in your book is like, when we speak, we need to be clear. When we write, we need to be clear. Like, uh, you know, take out all the fluff and your book does not have any fluff. You've got great stories You've got great strategies, especially like the, the one that you mentioned about the uh, uh, personality poly, polymath. What was it again? <laughs> a personality-based polymath. There we yeah, go. yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, uh, you've got some really amazing tips that, like you said, if you were to search on Google, you probably wouldn't be able to find some of these tips. Some of the tips in the book, yes, you can find, but not all of them. And that what that's what I think makes your book unique and worthy of reading. So thank you so much for that. Thank very, you. Very cool. And that's what the first A is about. When we're thinking about someone who's articulate, uh, we have to get clear on what that means. And it means different things to different people. 
Some may say that it's someone who has this melodic voice. Someone else may say it's a highly charismatic person. But if you boil down to the definition, articulate comes down to being clear, where others should feel silly for not understanding what you're saying. But what happens is that nowadays, when people become smart, educated, subject matter experts, they often have the tendency to not be clear. They use a lot of terminologies that a beginner may not understand. So the goal for Speak Easy was to speak easy. Don't speak difficult. Don't confuse other people. Make it so once you're done communicating with them, they feel smarter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you, you said, that's the first A. So what are the other two A's and how would you define those? The, uh, what is it? Assertive and audacious. Yes. So assertive is knowing the truth and standing for the truth. What it's not is to, and normally when people think of assertive, what they think of is someone who's aggressive. And that's a big mistake. When you confuse assertive with aggressive, then you'll typically be aggressive. And aggressive is someone who's hostile without needing to be. While with assertive is someone who's standing for the truth. For example, if there's a group of people that's coming to you and saying two plus two equals five, in an assertive tone, you could say, no, two plus two equals four. And it's not like you're being aggressive. You're just standing for the truth. And to stand for the truth, you have to go on a lifelong journey to discover some sort of truth. Or you got to experiment. You got to be building something. That's where the personality-based polymath concept ties in from the book. So assertive is about communicating in a certain way where you're communicating your two plus two equals four. You're not being someone who you're regularly not. You've been congruent to who you are. And audacious is someone who is willing to take risks. If you could, pre if you could predict every single thing that I'm going to say, you know what that makes me, Matt? Boring. And that's what the default state is for communicators who are scared. They'll say a lot of predictable things. It's just a checklist of things that they've planned beforehand, and they're not willing to take risks in the speech, in the conversation, in the writing. So being audacious is unlocking that side to you that's willing to experiment, willing to be creative, and that's what makes you an interesting personality. Mm, mm -hmm. I, like, uh, I like that last one there. Um, it kind of reminds me of uh, going back to your engineering background uh, with people who, uh, who uh, what was the story before we started this episode, you were talking about uh, engineers who don't really want to speak in front of people and they kind of try to pass, pass their, their speech off to someone else. <laughs> Can you touch a little bit on that? Yes. Yeah, so we were talking right before the show started about one of the pain points that a lot of engineers have, which is that they're great with designing the code, the PowerShell script, debugging. But what normally happens is that once you're done with the creation portion, you have to be able to communicate the idea. Let's say the systems that you manage crashed. Well, afterwards, there's going to be a thing called an RCA call, which is a root cause analysis call, where the different stakeholders want to know why that happened. And a lot of the times they're going to ask you questions. They may press you. And this is when a lot of engineers would be like, well, I don't want to attend the RCA call you attend it. And this is not good because the engineer should be capable of communicating the ideas too, rather than passing it off to someone else. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, Matt, I mean, I, the engineering position is one of the most important positions to be a great communicator in. And if you're great at that, now you're someone that is audacious. Like you're someone that's unpredictable. Like, whoa, this guy can speak to machines and to people. We don't normally see something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very true. And I'm, I'm guessing there are so many other fields out there as well that are similar to engineering where uh, typically, like maybe it's a behind the desk job when they, you know, they're not really speaking to many other people, yet communication is such an important skill, right? Like you, you cannot 
function in the world today without that uh, skill. Without yes. That skill. Yeah. In technical fields, especially where you're dealing a lot with numbers, a lot with formulas, you need to eventually, and even bankers, like let's say you're going to the banking department and your banker is telling you all these like accounts that you can open with all these percentage numbers. One of the best things to do is assume the person that you're speaking to has a big sticker on their forehead, which writes, so what? I mean, why are you telling me all this? And when you see this imaginary sticker on their forehead, it allows you to communicate in a way where you communicate to them as you're addressing their so what sticker. And this allows you to use more analogies, effortlessly tell more stories, and be clear where numbers aren't a problem, but flooding too many people with numbers is a problem. PowerPoints aren't a problem, but reading off the slides of a PowerPoint while your back is facing the audience the entire time, that's a problem. So mm. best to assume that people got that sticker says, so what? What's in it for me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, I'm just curious, like to, to help people out uh, with this like communication skills and stuff like that, what are the top five skills that have helped you to become a, a better communicator? Especially uh, you said that English is not your first language, if I'm not mistaken, right? Right. So I initially right. uh, spoke Bangla. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I learned English. And so two to five of the top skills you said for because yeah, top five skills. skills for communication. Uh, just like like you have built up Armani talks over the past like four or five years, right? So, like, what sort of top five skills have you used to uh, just build this thing up and communicate well with others uh, that maybe the audience listening and watching can can also take away? For sure. So. With engineering fields, the four most important uh, letters are S-T-E-M, which is science, technology, engineering, mathematics. For communication skills, the four most important letters are R-L-S-W, reading, listening, speaking, writing. Mm -hmm. If you could work on these four skill sets, you're going to be set for communications. So the first one is reading, which is highly important. That's why I love your brand so much because you encourage reading and you make it understandable. And reading is important because it allows you to understand a field in depth. And the better that you read, the better that you understand how to communicate your ideas in a clear way. It's critical thinking. It's understanding a field. It's so much. So reading is important. Listening is highly important too. And we have to understand that listening is different from hearing. Any dummy can hear. You just got to show up and your ears need to be working and you're taking in audio signals. But listening requires taking in the audio signals plus using your mind. And there's two types of listening. Uh, there's a sponge listening and then there's trampoline listening. A sponge listening is when you're just absorbing, right? Like a sponge. And mm -hmm. trampoline listening is what we traditionally know as active listening, where this is kind of like what me and you have going on. Like, I'll say something, you're listening, you'll ask me to expand, ask a question. So that, that's listening in a nutshell. Uh, speaking is, you could create a podcast, you could create public speaking, you could have, when you're having a conversation, have your mind present, that's speaking. And writing is something like journaling, tweeting, writing an email. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that these four, like at first they're like, oh, whoa, that seems like a lot. But you'll see a lot of the times they coexist together where like, let's say right now we're having the dynamic of listening and speaking. So we're doing both at the same time. So if you could work on these four skill sets, mm -hmm. it turns the field of communication skills from this blob into this structured thing that mm -hmm. you're like, okay, it's not that intimidating anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy how you, not crazy, but it's cool how you mention about writing and reading as part of speaking skills, right? 
a lot of people probably wouldn't think of writing and reading as, uh, as uh, like a way to build up speaking skills. So that's really cool mention. Um, and obviously, like I actually, I love both personally. I love writing and reading. So uh, yeah, hopefully uh, everyone listening can take those uh, those four points and really build uh, build that up in their lives. Um, and the, the the thing about listening, like I personally still have sometimes a tough time listening to people and actually like trying to process what someone is saying while they're saying it. Uh, Mm -hmm. because oftentimes people will think, try to think about what they want to say next while the person is still talking, which makes it harder for them to actually understand what the person is saying. And, uh, Mm -hmm. oftentimes that can become very annoying to the other person because in turn, the person's response may not even be related to what the person is saying, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, there was this one moment where you know, I was working at an engineering job and my manager was like, hey, we got this new worker. He's shy. He's not talking to anyone. Uh, we thought that, you know, you guys are around the same age that you could open him up. Uh, he's he's going to be important for our team. I mean, he's going to be one of the upcoming software engineers. So I go to his desk and I think he's Indian. And normally I notice that um, you know, if you sort of look like someone, they'll open up to you faster. So he looks at me. Um, I'm roughly around the same age. We look similar. And he's opening up to me. He's telling me a whole bunch of stuff. And I'm thinking, okay, well, that's not, that wasn't too difficult. And as he's talking, somewhere in the line, he says he lived in Virginia. So when he said that, I was like, whoa, I lived in Virginia too. So that's when I was like planning what I was going to say next. I was, I had my perfect question. I was going to be like, oh, how did you like your time in Virginia? Which part was it exactly? But that's when he continued to talk. He was talking about other projects that he did, uh, his life as a coder, what made him enter the field. But mentally, I was just stuck at that point. I was just like, I stopped talking already so I could ask you about Virginia. But that moment passed, right, for like three, four minutes ago, which is a long time in conversation skills land. And finally, when he was done, he was talking about like how he got the job here in the first place. When he was done, I was like, so how'd you like Virginia? And when he (laughs) heard that question, he just like, he just looked so disappointed. He's like, that's what you got out of all this. And that's when I thought, I was like, wait, what did he end with? And that's when I realized he ended with him telling me a story of how he got this job in the first place. So that was the most important part of the entire story, mm-hmm. but I didn't, I didn't listen properly. So I listened more with the ego because I was like, Oh, Virginia resonates with me. So it, it was just a bad look. And it showed me mm-hmm. that, you know, listening skills is a skill. Like you want to always practice. You always want to be in beginner mode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all the time yeah yeah uh i would say that you you said that he was talking for like four or five minutes right mm-hmm. yeah in my personal opinion uh disagree with me if you want to but uh i think uh if someone is talking for a really long time especially about several different things sometimes it kills the conversation that because they're not letting the other person get a chance to talk. Uh, For me, I I like short spurts of talking. I love like maybe a minute here, two minute here, let the other person talk. Um, That way it's more of a, a, like a back and forth type of conversation. It's a dialogue then it's not a monologue. And that is a problem, uh, Matt. I mean, rambling, that's another, I have a series on my YouTube channel called uh, the social sense the five social sense. I made a part one and part two and part one, one of them is rambling where this is something that well-intentioned people sometimes fall in the trap of different people ramble for different reasons. Some people do it because they're lonely where if you move to a new spot and you haven't talked to a person in a long time, when this person finally talks to someone, they forgot how to have a dialogue. They probably talk to themselves a lot. 
So they'll have the tendency to ramble. While other times it's because the person is just egocentric. They're like, oh, look at me, I'm the person. So rambling is a social sin. But um, one thing always to understand is like why people are rambling too, because there's like tears to it. Um, it. It is a sin though. This isn't something uh, that should be going on for a while. It's best when, you know, it's like what we're doing right now. We're going back and forth. Mm-hmm. Playing off of each other's thoughts and words. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so uh, that kind of leads me into like the, the next question here. Like what is the biggest mistake that you think people m- make when, when communicating with each other? Well, one of them is rambling where when a person is speaking too long, and this is typically also known as, this is, happens with well-intentioned people where they'll lecture and lecture is talking at someone rather than to them. So let's say I know something that you want to know, and I'm just over here just talking at you for a long time. And then you're just kind of like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That head nodding will give the illusion that you know, you're still engaged. But me lecturing is killing the engagement. So I think that's one big mistake that people make, which is rambling and not, and rambling is typically going to happen if the person isn't listening in the first place. So we got to listen. Uh, a big part of communication skills is putting yourself number two, which is not something that a person wants to do. They'll be like, put myself number two. What does that even mean? Um, a lot of social anxiety happens, Matt, is because someone is putting themselves as number one. They feel like they have to put on this show. Like, how am I going to say this certain word to you know, be liked even more? But it's better if you put the spotlight on the other person now you're hyper-focused and you'll notice that the conversation material just presents itself rather than you trying to be a star. So I would say rambling and trying to hog the spotlight too much. These are big Mm -hmm. communication mistakes. Mm, Yeah. Very good ones. Uh, And it like, I've been experimenting with the, the kind of the similar tool from how to win friends and influence people, basically like asking questions about the the other person because people love to talk about themselves Mm -hmm. although this could backfire depending on the person and depending on whether they're speaking from their ego right because if you start asking questions about that person uh then they all they want to do is talk about themselves and then they never ask questions back right i've had that happen on several occasions with people that i've met over the years uh and uh it's kind of frustrating because, well, you want to have a conversation, not just learn about them, of course you want to learn about them, but like kind of, it's like give and take, you know, like the person. Yeah. Yeah. Is that one of your, would you say that's one of your communication skips uh, sins too? It's like when a person is just answering questions, but not asking them back. Uh, Sorry. Could you repeat the question again? Would you say that's one of your uh, communication quirks to avoid when a person is just answering questions rather than asking questions back? Oh, yeah, for sure. Because uh, like after the meeting, that person might just go home and be like, wow, like I just had a conversation with someone else that only talked about themselves. Like Mm -hmm. that was all they talked about. They never like showed any sort of interest. Uh, So of course, I mean, that would be (laughs) one of the the quirks. And to be honest, it has happened, or I have also done it myself. I think maybe every person has has done that where they just talked about themselves, but that totally backfires. Like the other person is probably not going to want to be with you if the only thing you talk about is yourself. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, right. And that's why with listening, I mean, you want to you want it to be a trampoline unless you're a shoulder to cry on. That's when being a sponge listener is great, where you're just absorbing and doing a lot of head nods. But for the most part, I mean, trampoline listening is when you're getting a point and just amplifying it. And you could amplify it by asking questions and making sure that doing your best to make sure it's a dialogue. 
that that's one of the smartest things to do rather than one person talking, the other person just sitting passively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the, I guess sometimes there are people that you just cannot really change <laughs> and that's just how they are. Maybe well, because they never learned about it. Right. Another quirk. Yeah. See, this is the good thing about having a Twitter because every now and then a tweet is going to go viral. And when it goes viral, you'll see often it's polarized where one group is saying, yeah, I agree with this tweet uh, 110%. Another group is like, this is the most idiotic tweet I've ever seen. But there was this one tweet that went viral of mine where it was just everyone was in agreement. And it was like, when your friend wins and they're, they're talking about their win, don't try to get in there and talk about your own win too. Just sit back and listen to their win. And this was a tweet that went viral, like thousand, uh, over a thousand retweets, 3000 likes. Mm -hmm. And for a tweet like that, it's normally polarized, but everyone was just like, yeah, I mean, this happens to me so much. And it was a global problem. It wasn't just something that was happening in the U S or Australia or Africa. It was a global mm -hmm. problem where when sometimes people are talking about their win, the other person is like, okay, well now I, I got to talk about my win too. Otherwise, you know, and that's called e leading with the ego. That's not a smart thing to do. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Did you say, uh, talking about their win? Is that what you said? Right. So let's say I'm over yeah. here talking about my, a win that happened to me. Now you're like, okay, well now I got to talk about my win too, rather mm -hmm. than asking about the win further of my win. Right. So right. Yeah, this that was, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this was a, uh, a global communication problem. And a lot of these problems, it's not with a bad intent. It's just that's what the person knows best at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so we, we talked about the kind of the biggest mistakes people might make when communicating. How about what, what would be like the one thing if the people listening and watching this episode right now, like maybe the one thing that people can take away to implement right now in their life, what would that one thing be? I would recommend having some sort of content creation practice. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be hosting a show like you're doing right now. It could be participating in a Toastmasters once a week where you have to create a speech. It could be having a Twitter page. It could be journaling, something where you're getting in the habit of doing the T-O-L-D formula, which is thinking out loud. Uh, they combine L and D together. Uh, thinking out loud, where you should have a content creation practice, in my opinion. And it just makes it so much easier to understand where you stand on certain ideas. When you get in the habit of articulating your ideas, what happens is you spot gaps in understanding, and it makes you more confident as a person. So it doesn't matter what it is, but have something, especially in this era. It's the golden era of content creation. I mean, mm -hmm. you could start a Twitter account for free. And we don't have to pay to have this uh, episode right now. We're, I mean, there's so much great tools out there. So have a certain content creation skills practice, and you'll see yourself learning to think better, which eventually allows you to speak better. Mm -hmm. This is one of the biggest points that I actually agreed with. I mean, not that I disagreed with the points in your <laughs> book, but uh, I really loved the mention about this because this is in your book. I, I yes. totally remember this um, and I totally agree with it. I, I totally understand it because from my perspective, creating on through Bookmatic well, it's has it has made such a huge difference, and I think that's one of the uh, the reasons why I see so many uh, people out there also doing this, whether they whether they know the benefits of it or not. Uh, I see so many people out there on whether it's Twitter or Instagram or or YouTube, they're creating because it gives them the sense of like satisfaction, especially with like books. Uh, like Bookstagram, right, or Booktube, uh, people sharing the knowledge from the books that they read helps them to remember. Retain it, yes. Uh, retain. Um, but yeah, I mean, of course, 
Uh, I'm just speaking from my own personal experiences, but I like the mention that you said about uh, like journaling or going to Toastmasters. So if people don't want to, you know, create a bookstagram or booktube, they could do other things too, like journaling. There's I love journaling. so many options. And journaling is personal, right? So yes. we don't need, even need to share about journaling, uh, but just the cr- process of creation, writing or filming or uh, taking pictures or anything like that, I think is such a brilliant uh, tip for even for uh, improving our communication skills, right? Um, yes. Because we're sorting out our ideas. You're sorting out your ideas. And what you just said, I mean, you could make it public or private where with a journal, no one's going to see it besides you. Or you could be the kind of person who journals in public. That's what. That's how I started my Twitter account. I mean, it really is about the person, but having that content creation practice that you treat as a practice, however many times you want to do it a week, that's up to you. But if you treat it like a practice, you have no option but to improve your communication over time. So with you, Matt, I mean, you started with Bookmatic. Was that the first part of content creation that you had or were you doing anything before that? No, Bookmatic was the first. 2015, I started a free... Uh, blog spot blog originally i was just sharing on facebook and then i created that blog and i was writing reviews and then from there it just evolved and i just started sharing these reviews because i felt like it would be beneficial for people who read it beneficial for myself as well kind of a Mm -hmm. selfish thing uh but in a genuine way right? <laughs> it's okay to be a little bit selfish when you share. Yes. I mean, it's that a selfish, kind of sounds too, weird, right? selfish when you share. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it, it's a selfish to selfless transformation Yeah, where like a pilot, like let's say a pilot didn't take the time to be selfish and learn how to be a great pilot, but he means well, that's not a guy that you want riding your plane. You want a a pilot that took the time to be selfish, invested in themselves. Now they're being selfless by riding the plane. Mm -hmm. So it's a transformation. You don't just want to be selfish and just stick there. But if you're being selfish with the intent of improving yourself, leveling up, and then you become selfless, everyone wins. Yeah. Everyone wins. I mean, that's the goal. For sure. For sure. Armand, this is an amazing talk. I really love this. Uh, I hope Thank that you. everyone watching it is is also enjoying and getting a whole lot from it. Um, uh, so you yourself, you started your Twitter, right? Just also somewhat similar to me, like kind of a selfish but selfless uh, action. Is that true? Or um, absolutely, because for yeah. me, when I was, this is when I was realizing something. When I was public speaking, the whole act of writing, especially a tweet, because a tweet, I believe, is 280 characters, but sometimes you write it even smaller. That was getting me to think in a different way. When you write a tweet, compressing a big idea into a small idea allows you to understand the important parts of that idea. And it was making me a better public speaker, where in Toastmasters, they have a thing called the back pocket speech. Have you ever heard of that before? Uh, I haven't actually, no. So, so this is when normally in each Toastmasters meeting, there's three plant speakers that are supposed to speak. And every now and then life happens where one of them, let's say they have to stay late for work. So now there's two speakers. And that's when the, the club lead will be like, does anyone just want to give a back pocket speech? Just give a speech on the fly. And I'd often volunteer. And my tweeting experience was making back pocket speeches so much easier. So it was becoming a selfish thing where I was just like, yeah, I mean, I could improve public speaking by tweeting and I'll post more of my insights. And that's when I noticed that people were reading these insights and gaining value. So it was, it started off as selfish, but it became selfless where someone's like, they'll DM me. They're like, dude, I mean, I had, I had to speak up for a work presentation and I did that trick that you gave me where before I used to try to look at every single person in the audience, but you gave me this trick where you're like, as a beginner speaker, you just need to look at three people, one person from the left, 
one person from the middle, one person from the right. It helps if they're the most engaged members where you'll see their face. They're always like, you know, the smiling. Mm. Those Just look at them. And everyone around that person will also think you're looking at them. So this is a tip that he applied in his job that I was initially writing for myself. It was just a reminder. You, based off of what we were talking about before, when you articulate something, you're much more likely to apply it. So I was just articulating it for myself. And then they got value too. So it was a mm-hmm. selfish and selfless thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You are articulating yourself publicly. Yes. And right. <laughs> right. And you, you brought up a good point where you said, when you, when you articulate something, you're teaching yourself. Not only are you teaching yourself, you're much more likely to apply it. How often is it that you know, someone knows better, but they don't do better? They don't do better because they intellectually know it, but their body doesn't know it yet. And communicating your ideas allows your body to get familiar with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then there's people who, who also, uh, they articulate stuff publicly, but then they don't do it. <laughs> they don't interact. <laughs> <laughs> they know everything, but they're just, their behavior yeah. isn't catching up yet. Yeah. I think I saw something on your YouTube channel about the, getting yourself out of uh, analysis paralysis or something like that. Did you right. just produce a, a video about that recently? Recently, absolutely. So mm-hmm. the reason that analysis paralysis happens is because people, well, it's for a few reasons, but one of the reasons is because um, someone doesn't know the difference between learning and doing. Learning is when you're inputting information. Doing is when you're outputting information. But when you confuse them being the same thing, you're inputting information and you think you're doing. And in the video, I just talked about a buddy of mine who wanted to start an Amazon business. And he just kept asking me all these different questions. Like how many bullets should my listing have? How many capital letters should my headline have? What kind of shadows am I I'm like, dude, all this stuff doesn't matter. Just get started. And mm-hmm. I would say like two weeks goes on by and he's still like taking in more information, but he's telling his other friends like, Oh my, like I'm doing so much. I'm like, bro, you're not doing, you're learning. And since you're confusing the two, you're, that's why you're having analysis paralysis. So that's one reason people have analysis paralysis. And another reason was because, I mean, the quote, work smarter, not harder. Um, I think that's a noble quote, but I think it makes more sense when you have some experience. But when you don't have an experience, you don't really know how to work smart. So a little mental hack that I gave is flip the quote, work harder, not smarter. But when you're struggling with analysis paralysis, and you feel this primal urge that just breaks you out of analysis paralysis and you start doing. This was a trick that we did in Toastmasters where people would join the club, but they'd wait months to give their first speech. I'm like, what are you waiting for? You gotta, the more you wait, the more nervous you're gonna get. Like, get it done. They'll be like, no, I gotta be strategic. I gotta, you know, have the, I'm like, you have no data to be strategic. Work harder, not smarter. That's when they're like, oh, okay, let me give this speech. And mm-hmm. that's when they could chop away the data. It's yeah. like with you. I mean, like with your book review, it's like if someone's just saying work smarter before you ever wrote a book review, uh, I mean, would you know what that meant? Right, exactly. Like I would, when I first started writing, it was like I had no idea how to write a review. I mean, I, I studied a little bit about it, I guess. So I had some sort of structure, but uh, just putting it out there or maybe even like better, uh, like a YouTube video, like that's, you know, even for some people more tough, right? Than, uh, than writing something because you got to put your face out there. Starting this yes. podcast actually, uh, was also a little bit tough because I had no idea how to do a podcast either, but I just Mm -hmm. started like, and then each episode gets, gets better. Um, Each YouTube video gets better. Each review gets better. Um, So yeah, I, I think this point is that sometimes we don't know how to start. So all we have to do is just start and then get better from there. Yes. Uh, rather than trying to be perfect, you want to instead get in the habit of perfecting. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because when you're trying to be perfect, uh, you're suffering from perfectionism. Um, procrastination will never get you started. Perfectionism will never get you finished. Yeah, for sure. And really, to be honest, there is no such thing as perfect. Really? No. The, there's everything not. has imperfections, especially when it has to do with people. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, people can create stuff too, but even the stuff that is created is not going to be perfect. So, yeah. Uh, that's true. And, and we that's are one in, of the always sec- in the process of perfecting, like you said. Always, always yeah. be perfecting. That was one of the sections in Speakeasy where I bring up strategic flaws where if you're if you have a flaw like you steal from people that's not a strategic flaw that's a character flaw but if you're someone who let's say let's say you have an accent and i know some people watching this may have an accent they're like oh no this is the worst thing i gotta eliminate it completely on the contrary in tons of different speeches that i've been involved in when people hear an accent it's a pattern interrupt so it's like, whoa, like, what is this? And it makes them tune in more. I mean, not such a strong accent where it does, you're not enunciating or anything like that, but an accent where you're communicating your ideas with your own strategic personality into the mix. Now that becomes high ROI. There's a thing called the pratfall effect where people don't trust people that are being too perfect. In a logical world, maybe, but in the emotional world, what happens to the person is like, what is this person hiding? That's what they think. So the mm-hmm. pratfall effect is a psychological law, which states that we resonate with people that have imperfections because it reminds us that they're a person. They're not some sort of robot or some sort of con artist who's hiding something. Mm-hmm. So fl- flaws aren't a bad thing. Flaws can help you out if you look at the bigger picture. Yeah. Whenever I hear someone with an accent, it makes me wonder, where is this person from? I mean, if I don't know any, anything about the person, where is the person from? Where is their background? How long have they learned uh, how to speak English? And it, it, actually, it makes me question so many things about the person. Uh, mm-hmm. I suppose I will do that with anyone. It doesn't matter about the, the accent, but it just amplifies when I hear Amplified. the accent. It makes me very curious because... I love learning about different languages. I love learning about different cultures and uh, different people around the world. So I love your point about like, yes, it's, it's a pattern interrupt accents are, and it makes the person really focus in on what that person is saying and maybe even trying to figure out more about the person. Right. <laughs> right. It makes yeah, you curious. Yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. So, um, yeah, Armand, is there anything else that you would like to add to this conversation? I mean, we could continue talking on for, for a very long time if we wanted to. Uh, but, yeah, well, like, just let us know. Is there anything else that you would like to add? Well, I would like to say thank you for inviting me on for the interview. I, mm-hmm. I think what you're doing is great because what I do a lot is I write a lot. so. Seeing you review my book was a great experience because, you know, you're also a good uh, uh, cameraman. Uh, you guys should follow Matt on Instagram. Uh, when you had that picture of Speakeasy Up, I thought the lighting was great. But it's, it's great because from, the, from what we were speaking about before, RLSW, I mean, I write a lot, you read a lot. I mean, so that's a great partnership. Uh, I, I enjoyed this conversation a lot. I think that's one of the reasons we resonated because we're both in the communication skills field from different angles, but you know, we meet up in the same location. So if you guys enjoyed uh, this interview, I mean, you could learn more about me on armanitalks.com. I have a lot of my blogs, my podcasts, my videos, and my books on that site. And I routinely publish on there. So um, Mm -hmm. you could check me out further on armanitalks.com. For sure. And uh, I just wanted to add to that as well. Like, Follow our money talks on Twitter uh, because I, I recently started following you on Twitter 
And I just love all your little tweets here and there. Like they're brilliant. Uh, and I, I personally also just sub subscribe to uh, Armand's channel on YouTube. I think he's got some really cool, creative and useful uh, videos on there. I watched a few of them and uh, brilliant stuff you've got going on there. So if you want value, check out Armani Talks on any of the social media. And uh, like you haven't been too long on uh, Instagram, right? No, so Instagram, I'm going to have to take some tips from you because I'm a newbie there. Um, you could find me on Armani Talks underscore, okay, at Armani Talks underscore on Instagram. Uh, mm -hmm. That's one of those platforms that I got to learn more about still. So I'm going to probably hit you up for some advice on how to dominate Instagram. Uh -huh. it's, an, it's an interesting platform, but that's definitely for another conversation. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> <I bet>. uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm going to leave all the, the links to your website in the description. So everyone watching here, you can just go down to the description and uh, check out some of those links um, and definitely pick up a copy of uh, you know his book. We've got right here in the background if you're watching the video. Um, and you've got so many other books out there, right? like what, how many, 10 books, I think, published, right? 10 books, yes, 10, tons. Well, uh, yep, you'll, <laughs> yep, you'll see them on my site. I mean, some of them are exclusively available on Gumroad, while other ones, uh, for the people who love uh, paperback and such, uh, I have a presence on Amazon as well. I have um, speakeasies on Amazon, along with a couple of other books. So Armani Talk is where everything is like centered into one, but you'll see me in a lot of these different platforms. Mm -hmm. Great. So yeah, thank you so much for coming to the show. It's like really good conversation that we've had lots of value for the audience. So yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate you, Matt. And thank you for having me. And I appreciate we definitely, you Yep. We definitely need to do this again soon. Yeah, for sure. All right, everyone. Uh, take care and uh, don't forget to follow. Armand, <laughs> Armani Talks, and uh, we'll see you in the next episode.